good morning on this wonderful Palm Sunday 2020. Welcome to Battle Creek First Church for those who are listening. And uh, we are so happy that you are. And uh, we are looking forward to a time of worshiping God today. You know, and, and I think in, in these last few weeks, we have really come to appreciate togetherness and being together not only in, in uh, physically when we can, but certainly spiritually. And today is no different. I know that we have a few announcements here, but I, I'd like to read something that meant something uh, meant a lot to me this past week. Uh, this is from a devotional, uh, Experiencing God. It says, if you always choose the easy way, asking for the peaceful valleys, you will never see God's power displayed to enable you to take a mountain. Seek out the mountains and you will witness God doing things to your life that can be explained only by His mighty presence. And I tell you, that is so true and yet so hard to do. To, to want to take the mountain. Uh, sometimes I like the easy road. And yet in these days that we've been experiencing, we have found a few mountains we've had to take. Well, I also have uh, some prayer requests that uh, have been given to me over the last, uh, this past week. I know Bob Ryle and, and Bruce, their sister, Deborah, uh, just got out of the hospital. And so we want to be remembering Deborah in our prayers. And, uh, one thing about uh, what's going on right now, it doesn't matter what's going on when it comes to prayer. We can always pray for each other. <clears throat> we know God is listening. Also, pray for our pastor, pastoral search. Uh, we know that it has been slowed down a bit by everything that's happening. And the district superintendent search is going to begin, or really already has. Uh, we've already started praying about that. And so I want you to keep praying for uh, our search for a, a new leader in the district, but also right here in our own uh, church here in the body of Christ. I also think it's important for us to be praying for our senior adults uh, and also those who have un uh, underlying health issues. We have been warned how, how critical that is with this virus. So be praying for all of our senior adults. We don't get to see them right now normally. Uh, they are, uh, it's hard to do that because we're trying to keep our distance for good reasons. Also, I think there are those who, uh, who have needs which uh, they're not being met. Even in our church family, that is likely happen. I know there are people in this community here that uh, they have needs. Pray for our uh, food pantry. It is critical right now. It's considered critical and it is. There are people who need food. The, uh, when you look at the news, of course, you probably are frightened. And uh, because of all the things that are being reported. But today we know who is in charge. Finally, I have some uh, just some updates here in terms of announcements. Uh, just uh, continue to stay connected, whether it's Facebook, email. Uh, you can even send something through snail mail, uh, through the post office. I think it only takes about a day or two to get where it's going. You're just sending it to one another. Let's do that. Uh, <clears throat> Also, call the church. Call the church number. Leave a message. We will get back with you. This is being monitored uh, every day and looked at. Send an email if you want to. Uh, text someone. You can text me if you have my phone number. And if not, call the church number and I'll make sure I call you back. And uh, just stay connected. We're thinking about our youth. Uh, youth are, are staying connected. Uh, Brenda is, is doing a fa fabulous job. Her and her team 
with the youth. I, I see they're, they've put out a, a newsletter now. Uh, uh, I think it's called The Navigator. And uh, it's, uh, I, I read that, and, and you need to read that too. It's uh, actually go to their page, their Facebook page, and you'll be able to read what's going on with the youth. Uh, let's see here. We've got, uh, again, continue to give. Uh, we're, thank, we're just thankful for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, let's continue to do that. Either uh, mail it in, go online, go to the website, uh, look at the top right corner, push give. That will take you to another page. Down at the bottom, look for the word give. It's highlighted. Push that. And you'll be right there where you need to be to start to fill out a form to do your giving, your tithe and offering. But with all these things, I think now it's time for us to worship God in, in praise and song. And uh, that's what we need to do now.
perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shape, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who gives us hope, who saves us, who, who comforts us, even in the midst of our fears. Let us fix our eyes on Christ, singing, Today is the day we're casting our cares aside, we're leaving our fears behind. We are focusing on Jesus Christ.
Even if we need to be six foot apart, why do we even do that? Why do we take communion together? And what does it matter? These are the questions that I sense God has laid on my heart to answer today to you. These questions bring back many memories for me personally as I ask them. Uh, my time in the military, and some of you out there, you have served in the military. And I tell you, I don't know how many times I would ask myself, why are we doing this? All the things we would do, I couldn't help but ask myself, why are we doing this? For example, in basic combat training, we were taught four life-saving steps. I mean, they ingrained them into our minds. They told us that we would first do this when we would come up on a fellow soldier that needed help. We would clear the airway. We would stop the bleeding. We would protect the wound. And we would treat or prevent the shock. That's what we were taught. It was ingrained in us. And I always would ask myself, why did I need to know this so well? Why did, you, why did they put that in my brain? And I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't forget it. But you know what? I, I've since realized that I've had to use this knowledge on an occasion or two. And even my son, who served five years in the military, went to Iraq. He remembers these life-saving steps. And uh, here, just a few years ago, he was hiking up uh, a mountain. He likes to hike mountains. And he, would, he went up there and he got up to the top and there was this older gentleman. He was obviously in trouble. He couldn't breathe. Or something was wrong. And so Ray jumped in there and put those four life-saving steps to work. And before you know it, this guy started coming around. And he knew it instantly. He had to treat for shock because the guy was in shock. And, uh, and he knew that. So he began to take care of that. So I, I, I know there was a reason for that in basic combat training. Why we had to learn those four life-saving steps. Here's another lesson we learned. That we were taught to do police call. Now, no, it wasn't calling the police. But we called it police call. Where we would stand shoulder to shoulder and comb a, a, a a relatively small area. We would all get shoulder to so shoulder and walk through there and you would pick up anything you could find on the ground that wasn't growing. I mean, you pick it up. It didn't matter what it was. A cigarette butt, that's usually what we found. Uh, and anything else. And I, I used to think, I said, this is over the top here. I mean, we got 50 people out here, shoulder to shoulder, going through this area. It'd probably take about three people to clean it up in, in a short period of time. But we would do this. I mean, day in and day out. And I always thought about that. I said, why? Why are we doing this? But you know, later, what that really taught me, I realized later, was it taught me a, a attention to detail. <coughs> It taught me, I tell you, that served me throughout my life. Attention to detail. It also taught me pride. And it taught me the value of ownership. And finally, in basic con combat training, we were taught hurry up and wait. We would get up at 0 dark 30. That's 4.30 in the morning, if you don't know that. We would get up. We would draw our weapons from the arms room. We would load up on cattle cars, as we call them. And you can tell why if you see them up on the screen there. We would get, uh, we would get on those things, and I was saying, why are we doing this so early in the morning? I could have slept two more hours. When we got there, we, were, we found out we had to wait. We, our time up on the range wasn't for two more hours. And yet, we use that two hours to, to study weapon safety over and over again. We also studied the, what we call the, the steady hold factors. 
How you hold a weapon. How you breathe in. How you breathe out. Hold it. And then squeeze the trigger. We would practice that for those two hours that we waited on the range for our turn. Sometimes if we had a little extra time there waiting, we would even get a power nap, which would kind of help out a lot. But I learned over the next 30 years in the, in the Army the value of hurry up and wait. I mean, it taught me to build some extra time into what I'm doing. And it also taught me to be on time. Well, you're probably wondering, why, well, why all these things you're telling us about learning lessons in the, in the Army? But the, the thing is, I had to figure out why I was doing what I was doing. And sometimes it's much later in life that we figure out why we were doing what we were doing. Please turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 11. And if you prefer, the words will be up on the screen behind me. And uh, in this passage in Mark chapter 11, Jesus and His disciples are approaching Jerusalem where the Lord will begin His final preparation for His journey to the cross. And let me begin in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of His disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. Verse 4. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied in the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and he threw and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their clo cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Verse 9. Those who those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. In this account, Jesus is making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He chooses the time of the Passover celebration to make His final move towards the cross. Yes, there are many people there. And many people are following Jesus. They are praising Him. They have been seeing or hearing his, about His miracles. They know because of the miracles, if nothing else, they know He was sent by God. They sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is, is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They sing. They sing this Hosanna, which really means save us now. That's what they're saying. Save us, O King Jesus. But do they really know why they sing this? Really? Do, do, they, do they really understand who Jesus is? Who they are singing to and who they're singing about? You see, I am thinking Jesus often instructed His disciples to do things that they didn't really understand. They didn't know why they were doing it at the time. I also believe that the disciples would at times just ask themselves, why are we doing this? Oh, Rabbi, why are we doing this? Even as they were approaching Jerusalem, 
And Jesus instructed His disciples to go to the village ahead to get this colt, this donkey. He sort of instructs them as if they themselves have no idea why they're going to get that colt. He says to them, if anyone asks you why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it. And we'll send it back here shortly. What about you this morning? What about me? Is it possible that we too are doing things or maybe living a certain way and yet have forgotten why we are doing it? Maybe it's just become a habit. Maybe a routine. You know, to get up on Sunday morning. I'm sure nowadays, these last couple of three weeks, you're missing that, aren't you? Getting up and getting dressed and coming to church. It's a routine in some ways. It's what we do. What about prayer? Has prayer become just a routine? I mean, you have a certain time you pray? Certain words you use? How about reading your Bible? Is it really just about reading through the whole Bible for the year? Is that your routine? Is that something you do? You know, these, I could go on and on. These are good things. Don't get me wrong. They are great spiritual disciplines. And I'm so thankful that we have, it to, have these to do. But what has happened to the freshness of those disciplines? Really? In your life, ask yourself that. Where is the spark of the passion in these things that we do? Is it still there? Are we just doing them? What might be the reasons that we need to be reminded about these disciplines today? What is it? Especially right now. In this message, we will be reminded about why we are doing this thing we do called church. Why do we do church? Why do we come to church? Why do we worship? Well, let's turn in, the, in a passage that I hope will help answer these questions. And I think they're urgent questions that are being asked. The Lord's reminding us today about this. Why are you doing what you're doing? Psalm 118. I think it's an appropriate psalm, really, because that Hosanna actually comes from that psalm. The, the, the saying that people are using as Jesus comes into Jerusalem comes from the Psalm 118. Well, let's look at that, beginning in verse 1. And I'm going to read 1 and then jump down to verse 21 real quick. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. And then jump down, drop down if you're following this morning, Psalm 118. And it's on the screen. Verse 21 says this, I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Then in verse 25, the psalmist writes, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, we, we bless you. Or from the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. And he has made his light shine on us. With balls in hand, join in a festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Wow. That's a mouthful. That's praising God. Ooh, that's why it's so, it, it is so much. It takes my breath away. You know, I want you to notice that the first and the last verse, verses of that passage say, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. 
His love endures forever. Church, these words are telling us we must recognize that whatever God wants for us or whatever He wants us to do, it is bathed in love. Love. Uh, you know, He knows that. He, he, he sees that He is love. He is in love with us. And His love endures forever. I believe this morning God is lovingly urging each one of us to look inside at our hearts and know why we are doing this. Why are we doing this? We need to take inventory of why we worship this great God. And that is what we will do today together. Well, the first thing I want you to see is in verse 21. The psalmist says, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. As I read this verse, it becomes clear to me that God knows me and He hears me. And the psalmist gives thanks to the Lord who hears him and thus answers when He calls upon Him. Is there someone listening right now who is thankful to God for something? If so, I want you to do this. All of you out there, I want you to text it to us right now. We need to testify to God because others need to hear it or see it or read it. So I want you to text. If, you, if you're listening, and I don't know how many folks are on right now, but you testify. Tell us what you're thankful for from God. I tell you, God wants to be thanked. And folks, each and every one of us can always say to Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, for coming to save me. Thank you for my salvation. So I ask you, church, why are we doing this? Why do we worship the Lord? Why? Because we are thankful for our salvation. We are thankful for Jesus coming. You see, our salvation is here. He lives. And He speaks to us. Next, the psalmist proclaims in verse 22 that our salvation is built with a cornerstone that many have and will reject. It is a living stone provided by God. It is His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 24 informs us the Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. I can't help but want to say, be glad in it, as the song says. And what is it that we can rejoice in today? Our salvation. Most of you know that I can't sing very well. <clears throat> Thus, I won't try to sing the song that's on my heart right now. But instead, I have asked Pastor Hannah to come up and help lead us as we rejoice in our salvation this morning. I want us to do it. I want us to demonstrate it. So if you're at home and, and you're watching, you're going to know this song and it's up on the screen or it will be in about a second. And I'm going to ask Pastor Hannah to go ahead and share it and I'll get out of the way just for a moment. If you don't know this song, just have your kids at home sing it for you. This is the day. This is the day. Today is the day for all of us to rejoice and be glad in it. To be glad that we have salvation. 
We need to be thankful for that, folks. And I realize that many of us are wondering right now what tomorrow will bring. I get it. I'm wondering too. I don't know. And yet we are encouraged to not fear each new day. But rather, be glad in it. This is the day of salvation. And I ask the church, why are we doing this? Why are we praising God when everything else seems to be falling apart around us? Why? Because we are joyful for our salvation. Amen? That's, that's what it is. Our salvation is today. It's on time. It is right now. When we need it the most. I say again, I will be glad in it. Well, last, but certainly not least at all, looking at verses 26 and 27 of this text, we see some of the actual words borrowed by Mark to put into this chapter that we read earlier, that the people were singing when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. These, these were the words that, that they were shouting loud as He comes in and, and putting down the the branches on, on the uh, on the ground and the cloaks. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and He has made His light shine on us. You see, back in the days of the temple in Jerusalem, this would be a kind of a common greeting for the priests to come to the people. Come before the people. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they would say. In the house of the Lord, we bless you. What I hear the psalmist saying is that our hearts should be bubbling over right now with hope. Because we have hope. Even in these days, we have hope. We who call ourselves children of God can be hopeful in these days of hopelessness. The world is without hope because they don't know Jesus. So church, I ask you, why are we doing this today? Why are we here? Why do we care that others need to know Christ? Why? Because we are hopeful. We are hopeful for a salvation that only comes through Christ. We are also hopeful for a salvation that others need. The psalmist tells us, I am what I am because I am thankful for my salvation. I am what I am because I am joyful for my salvation. And I am what I am because I am hopeful today for my salvation. And I am hopeful for the salvation of the world even today. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Well, I want to uh, invite uh, uh, Paul to come up and uh, he won't know that for about a minute here, but he'll come up and we will uh, serve. Well, at, the, at this time, and I said Paul's going to come up, and he's going to come up at the end. But I invite all of us, we're going to practice uh, distance, our distance and uh, Everyone that's in this room right now, which is not very many of us here, but you'll come up and, and they'll serve themselves the elements, and then Paul will come up and feed again and serve himself.
moment you want to have your elements uh, together. And uh, you got all, all kind of huddled together at home and we will uh, partake here in a few minutes. We are reminded that uh, as we are gathered here, even at this moment, that our Lord, uh, He resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven to be our advocate, to sustain us, to carry us, and to someday come back again. Until He returns, we are instructed to remember what He has done on the cross for us. We do this today at this table. You are doing it at home, right where you're at. And... Uh, the Lord Himself, He ordained this. He ordained the Holy Sacrament of Communion. He commanded His disciples to partake of the bread and the cup, emblems of His broken body and shed blood. This reminds us of the cost of our sin. This is His table prepared for us, for you and me. In the Church of the Nazarene, as most of you have heard many times, we practice open communion. This means that all of those with, who have uh, come with true repentance and you have forsaken your sins and you have believed in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you may come. Let us remember this is a commemoration of the death and the passion of our Lord. It is a, a celebration too, or a thank you that we can do. It's our way of presenting ourselves. It's an act of worship. We participate as a family, even in these strange times as we're doing it uh, online and here at the, at, at the sanctuary. And more, I, you know, the thing that really stands out for me as I, I look at the words here, it is, our, our, you know, by doing this, we are anticipating He is coming back soon. Amen. We don't know when, but I always say soon. And uh, we remember that. Let us not forget that we are one at one table with one Lord. Let me pray before we take these elements. Lord, may we come before You in true humility and faith Lord, as we partake of this holy sacrament, may we come as our true selves, not in any other way, Lord. And may we do that now. In Christ Jesus. Amen. We are reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, He took the bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Well, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us take this cup together. And with that, I, I want us again to, rem to remember why we do what we do. We just did this because we are thankful for our salvation. Amen. We, 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 we are so thankful at this point uh, in our lives. And, and it, I think even today, especially in this kind of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, and not only that, uh, as we look forward, and I, and I want you to be looking ahead now. We're going into the Holy Week. And we're excited about Easter. We're excited about uh, coming together again on Easter. On that beautiful morning. 
And I, I, I'm kind of fond of doing the sunrise services myself. You know, I don't know if they're as popular as they used to be, but I don't mind getting up at Ogar 30. Well, maybe not that early. But just starting that morning out real early at the sunrise and thinking about that morning when those women went to that tomb, they went there expecting to find a tomb with Jesus in it. And they were going to put more uh, spices on him. So they went there expecting to find a dead Jesus. And oh, were they surprised on that morning. So we're looking forward to this week as we, as kind of the final road to Jesus' resurrection. And I'm looking forward to spending that with you out there, everybody who's listening. The praise team was looking forward to it. And so you have a great, wonderful, holy week. May God richly bless you.